Okay, hey guys, how you doing? This is um, Chapter 5, Congress, the Legislative Branch Video Lecture. Um, in this chapter, the, the big idea is consisting of, the House and represent, consisting of the House of Representatives and the Senate, Congress exercises powers by passing legislation, representing the people, and checking the power of the other governmental branches. And the essential questions that you will need to know or understand or answer are the following. How does Congress check the powers of the executive and judicial branches? What powers does the Constitution give to Congress? Which principles of representative government are embodied in the House of Representatives? Why is the Senate called the Upper House of Congress? And the last one, how does Congress pass legislation? So by the end of this chapter, you should be able to um, know and answer those five essential questions. So let's get started here. Um, chapter 5, Section 1. Um, this is basically just kind of a um, um, overview of what Congress does. Uh, the voters elect members of Congress to represent them and enact laws in their, in, in their name. Congress plays a vital role in our government system of checks and balances. So Congress and the people um, we have a representative government, and representative, the representatives of this government, um, the idea is that they are going to represent our interests uh, of the constituents, which is, which is me and you. The constituents are the people they represent, and they do this by passing laws. Um, representatives also in, are, in, are also influenced by interest groups, and interest groups are like-minded people who join together because they have a common um, cause that they want to influence the government by. And a great example is the NRA, the National Rifles Association. They are a like-minded people who join together to try to influence members of Congress to make sure gun laws are not restricting people who want to have guns, that people are allowed to have guns. So that would be a, a good example of interest groups who try to influence um, the government through the representatives. Uh, representatives also, um, their job is also to promote the common good for the entire country. Sometimes this is a difficult thing to do is when they are passing laws. Should they pass laws that are good for just their constituents, the people they represent, or maybe passing a law um, is better for the whole country and not maybe not so much their own state or district they represent. Okay, members of the Congress, um, usually they're going to be older, wealthier, white males. Um, however, this has, Congress has become more diversified uh, more recently, but for the most part, on average, members of Congress are one of these, or all of these um, characteristics of Congress. All right, the structure of Congress. Um, Congress is a bicameral Legislator meaning there's two chambers, two main chambers, and the first chamber, or considered the lower house of the of Congress, is the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives um, is based on population. This is called apportionment. Every ten years, due to from the census, we reapportion. Um, the, the districts and how many seats each state gets. So based on how based on how many people live in your state depends on how many representatives you get in the House of Representatives. So it's based on um, population. This is called apportionment. Uh, there are 435 total members in the House of Representatives today. Uh, this has been this has been since 1929. We've had that number. It's a fixed law. They could add more if they wanted to, um, but since 1929, that's where we've been, and it's always shifts and changes depending on how many people live in each state, how many states get each, um, how many representatives they get per state. So 435 is the total, and they serve two-year terms. Every two years, they're up for re-election. And the idea of this is that the House of Representatives is supposed to be closer to the people, and because these these people are closer to the interests and, and um, ideas of the people, every two years they they are up for re-election, and if the people don't like what they're, how they're representing them, they can be 
um, turned around and put someone else in there who, who does represent them better. Okay, the other part of the bicameral legislature is called the Senate, also the upper house, or also known as the upper house of Congress. Um, it's not based on population, it's equal distribution. It's two per state. So since we have 50 states, every state gets two senators, which equals 100 in total. So the total number of our Congress is 535, um, 435 in the House and 100 in the Senate. And they're in office for a longer term compared to the House. Um, they're there for six years. And they're staggered. Every six, every um, every two years, a third of them are up for re election. A third of the hundred members are up for re-election. And this is so there's not a huge, um, swift change in in mem members in the Senate compared to the House. You can have a total change in who's the majority party every two years. You can. Um, one to every two years, it can be this the Republicans. The next two years, it can be Democrats. In the House of Representatives, where the Senate, it's it's a lot less like it's let it's less likely that you're gonna have these huge swings in party control in the Senate because it's staggered every every some um, two years, a third of them are for re-election. All right, so those are the two. Um, that's the structure of the of the Congress. Um, Congress and checks and balances. One of the one of the principles or one of the um, Things our constitution is built around is these is the system of checks and balances where the power is divided up between three branches of government and um, they can check each other's powers of the three branches. So, how does Congress check the 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 powers of other branches of government? That's basically what this is. What we're going to talk about here. Um, one way the Congress can check the power of the other branches, or especially the executive branch, is having the power of the purse. What that means is they control the budget. They control how much money can be spent and, and not spent. And appropriation is a type of bill that that sets aside funds or money for a specific purpose. So if the president would like to go to war and fight somewhere, Congress can either allow that to happen by passing an appropriation bill that, that pays for it, or they could decide not to pay for it and not pass a appropriation bill, which causes the president not unable to fight a war because he has no money to pay for it. So a check that they have is the power of the purse, having the ability to control the money. Another check they have on the executive branch is the power of advice and consent. So anytime a president signs a treaty with another country, it must be approved or uh, yeah, approved by the Senate, and also if the president appoints any officials like federal judges or members of his cabinet, they too must be approved by the Senate. So that's another check they have over the president. The president can pick these people, but the Senate must approve of them. A third check, which can be on either the judicial or the executive branch, is impeachment power. So Congress is the ones that actually actually um, impeach people, and um, if you're found guilty, you're removed from office. So if you're charged, if you're officially charged, um, any member of the executive or judicial branch of doing anything wrong, um, this can include like treason, bribery, or any high or or high crimes, which is in quotation because what does high crimes mean? or even a misdemeanor, if you're accused or convicted of any of these, you can be impeached and thrown out of office. The fourth type of check that Congress has, um, or other ones, are amending the Constitution. So, for instance, if the judicial, if the Supreme Court, part of the judicial branch, interprets the Constitution in a way that the Congress doesn't agree with, they can amend or add the con to the Constitution so that the interpretation of the Constitution changes in their favor. So many of the Constitution is one way. Um, overriding a president's veto, 
if, a, if, a, if they really are, or if the Congress is really behind a certain bill, and maybe they're um, they have an unpopular president, it'd be easy for them to override a president's veto in order to pass a law that they feel confident about. Um, the other one, the third one, another way they can check the powers of the executive branch is oversight. So if they feel like any government agency is not doing their job properly, they're not, they're not enforcing the law that they passed, they can actually hold hearings and have witnesses appear in front of them and, um, you know, in a, do an investigation. And if they feel like they're not following the rule, they can um, remove them from office. So they, they oversee or over, overwatch or, or watch the executive branches um, federal agencies making sure that they're actually doing their job properly and if so they, if they're not then they'll um, they can remove you from office so that's another check they have on the executive branch all right so section two the powers of Congress um, the main idea of this section is that the Constitution gives Congress many express powers and it implies some others the Constitution also places limits on the powers of Congress so we're gonna look at the different types of powers Congress has so first, defi let's define what the powers of Congress are. There are there are four types of powers Congress has or doesn't have. Um, the first one would be express powers. Um, these are found in Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution. There's 18 specific powers given to members of Congress, um, ranging from coining money, collecting taxes, regulating commerce, raising and maintaining armed forces, and declaring war. Um, so Article One, Section Eight. There's 18 specific ones. Those are express powers because they're expressly written in the Constitution. The second type of power they have is what's called implied powers because the 18th specific power in the Constitution under Article 1, Section 8, um, it says that Congress shall make or can make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. And because of this clause, the necessary and proper clause, it's an implied power, meaning as long as it means that they can make laws that relate to any of the expressed specific powers in the Constitution. Third type is inherited powers. These are powers that are not actually in the Constitution, but um, but have like developed over time just from tradition, um, and usually they um, they involve foreign affairs and. Normally, if it's anything to do with foreign affairs, that's kind of a president's area of jurisdiction, and um, so they don't necessarily wield any. They don't wield too much power, inherited powers, um, too often. And the fourth type is a den is denied powers, powers they don't actually have, and there are there are lists of specific powers that they're denied in Article One, Section Nine, and we'll talk about those in a minute here. All right, so let's look at the express powers of Congress. They're going to fall into three broad categories and then anything that doesn't fall in those three categories is just like others that just hang out they're not in no, in no specific category at all so the first broad ca category is is financing powers um, so the Constitution gives Congress the power to raise money to run the government through two means um, levying taxes which is one or borrowing money so these are these are the two ways the government makes money by taxing us and then borrowing money from other countries uh, or yeah to help pay for certain things um, so that's one example that's what type of power that they have that's financial um, the second broad category is commerce powers and the specific power in the Constitution says that they can regulate foreign and interstate trade this is also called a commerce clause because um, commerce is the is buying and selling and trading of goods, and what does it mean for Congress to regulate foreign interstate commerce trade? Um, there was a huge case that det that established what that what does commerce clause mean? What does that for the Congress? Which is, it's in the, the case of Gibbons versus Ogden, which involved the right of a state legislator to award a monopoly to operate a steamship line for travelers between. Uh, New Jersey and New York. Um, so, state of New York gave a gave a company the a monopoly to 
run people back and forth across the river to the New Jersey New in New New York um, New York New Jersey, and this went to all this the Supreme Court. They didn't think it was fair that one person can monopolize that, and so the Supreme Court struck down this state law, ruling that only Congress has a right to regulate interstate commerce, and um, because of that, this kind of established what what is the commerce, what does commerce mean to Congress, um, so. Commerce powers is another is one is a second type of cat, second category and the third category that that would fall under um, the, when you look at all the express powers of Congress is defense related powers and this would include the power to declare war and create an an army and navy and fund it as well so they can create an army and also I should I forgot I'd add on there but they maintain a militia and today the militia is called the National Guard and uh, the states take. The states are the ones that run the National Guard unless the president calls them um, for emergencies, and the governor can also has power of a National Guard if they have, if you have local or state emergencies within your own state. But um, these powers that are specifically in the Constitution will be considered defense-related powers, power to declare war, create an army and navy, and also fund it and maintain a militia. Um, and then the rest of the powers would just... They have no really, no really category that would fall under. There's kind of others. So, so other powers that Congress has would include coining money, establishing and um, running the post office, copyrights and patent laws, what's the weights and measures, um, bankruptcy laws, naturalization, which is a hot topic for today these, right now because of Arizona's passing their immigration state immigration law. Um, people feel like that's not they don't have the power to do so because that's a power of Congress um, establishing the federal courts and also determining what um, when it comes to congressional elections Congress has a power to make laws about the time place and manner of electing its members um, but usually this is the, the finer details are left to the states for the elections but anyways so those are the other express powers that they have, just not, they don't still fall into one of these three broad categories, either financing, commerce, or defense. All right, implied powers. So we looked at, um, they have different types of powers. One's expressed. Second type of powers is implied powers. And these are powers that allow Congress to take action needed to carry out one of the express powers. So again, this kind of, this goes back to the, the 18th express power in the Constitution under Article 1, Section 8, uh, the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, now what that means is it means different things to different people. Um, either you are a loose or strict constructionist, meaning you interpret the Constitution either loosely or strictly. Um, a loose constructionist would say that the Necessary and Proper Clause gives you freedom to act if something were necessary and proper. So as long as it if whatever the action you need to do is necessary and proper to um, help out America or make America better, um, then the necessary and proper clause allows you to do that. You, are, you have more flexibility in what types of laws Congress can pass. Compared to a strict constructionist who would say that Congress can only pass laws that are clearly stated or granted to them in the express powers. If it's not in there, then they have no business passing a law that that they have no they have no business passing a law that they can't um, they're not allowed to through the Constitution the Constitution is not given that power so the implied power of Congress is comes from the necessary and proper clause and you're either a loose constructionist where you think that Congress should act freely and have the flexibility to pass laws that aren't necessarily in the Constitution or a strict constructionist which says you Congress can only pass laws that are expressly written in the Constitution. Um, the thing about this is that members of the, when the founding fathers were writing the Constitution, they couldn't write every power that Congress has. That would they, or if they if they did, that's going to make it a really long, difficult um, process. So this necessary and proper clause kind of, kind of gives them a, a loophole or a, a, ho a, a loop to get out and be more flexible. So loose and strict constructionists. All right, third type of powers they have are, are what's called non-legislative powers, which means they don't deal with uh, making laws. They're not related to making a law. But they are, these are powers they have in the Constitution. 
So some powers that they both that both houses have. When I mean both houses, I mean both the House of Representatives and the Senate have. Um, both of them can propose amendments to the Constitution. Doesn't matter if it's from the Senate or the House. They both can do that. They both can conduct investigations on government officials or government agencies, and they're both involved in the impeachment process. They both have they have separate separate um, um, jobs in the impeachment process, but they both are. It's a two-part thing, and they both are involved in that impeachment. Um, powers that are specifically for the House that are non-legislative. Um, if there's not a majority during the Electoral College, then the House of Representatives are the ones that get to choose who the president is, and that's partly because the House of Representatives is supposed to be the, the chamber that's closer to the people. Therefore, they're the ones that's going to choose who the leader of the people is going to be. Um, if this does take place... Even though you may have, like, for instance, California has like 53, 54 representatives uh, from the state of California, they only get one vote. Same with Nevada, which has, um, we have four now. Um, even though we have four House representatives, we do, the state of Nevada only gets one vote. So every state gets one vote, and the majority, majority would win, who's it, whoever the president, um, who they're voting for, for president. Powers are specifically to the Senate. Well... They choose who the vice president is um, if there's no majority in the Electoral College still. So president is chosen by the House, and the vice president is chosen by the Senate. And same thing, same rules apply when it comes to voting. You get one state gets one vote, even though there's two senators from each state. And then the other thing they get to do, the Senate, that's specifically to them, is they approve any treaty or presidential nomination that a president gives, that has to be all approved by the Senate. Those are so non-legislative powers that are specific to the Senate. Okay, so we looked at express powers, inherited powers, non-legislative powers. These are powers that are denied to them or limits of powers that Congress has. One type of power that's limited to them is it comes from the separation of power principle of our government. Um, are, and so an ex examples of this is judicial review and presidential vetoes. Um, the Supreme Court or, or, the, or federal court judges, they have the power to review any law passed by Congress and determine if it's constitutional or not. So um, this power that they have to write laws is limited by the courts in their review of it and determining if it's constitutional or not. And then the president also limits their power when they can veto a law. Or I'm sorry, a bill, so it doesn't become law. Um, so that's another limit of their power. They're not denied. They can write pass bills. Not they're not denied, but they're limited on if it's constitutional or not by the constitution by the determined by the Supreme Court justices or if the president even likes the bill in the first place and he may veto it. Another limit to the Congress's powers is um, ones that are that are specifically in the Constitution. For instance, when they wrote the Constitution. Congress couldn't have passed a law that ended slavery until after 1808, and they also can't have any law that um, put places a tax on exports. Exports is whenever any products from America leaves and goes to another country, there are no taxes on that. So they, those are powers that are, that are denied to Congress, and specifically in the Constitution. And there's another clause in the Constitution that that's designed to protect your civil rights, and there's three of them, and this is one of the reasons, kind of one of the main reasons, the Federalists didn't believe you needed a Bill of Rights in the Constitution because of these civil rights already in the Constitution, but the three basic civil rights that um, that Congress is denied to do is called one is called writ of habeas corpus, and let's see, it's Latin meaning you have the body. But basically what a writ of habeas corpus is, is whenever you're arrested or charged, uh, or whenever you're arrested, you, you must, they must have a reason. That, but the police must have a reason for holding you. They can't just hold you because they don't like you. They have to have a reason to hold you. And you usually have 20, you get 24 hours, and within 24 hours you're going to see a judge, and they're going to give you a reason why you're being held. And if they don't have anything to hold you on, then, then they'll release you. So you must have, they must have a reason to hold you, writ of habeas corpus. The second... Basic civil right that you that's in, included in the Constitution is called Bill of Attainer. Um, 
basically you can't be punished without a trial. If you're charged with a crime, they they hold you and they have a reason to hold you. You they can't just hold you forever. They they you must be able to go to trial. So a bill of attainer they can never pass a law to get rid of this right. Um, bill of attainer. And the third one is ex post facto law, um, which is Latin for meaning from after the fact. And for and basically what it is, if you commit a crime, if you committed a crime that took place in the in the past, and at the time it was legal, but now is it? But now currently it's illegal. They can't go back in your in the past and and arrest you for a crime that was legal at this at the time it was when it was legal. So criminalize an action that took place in the past that was legal at this at that time. You can't be cr criminalized if you broke a law that was legal at the time and now it's illegal and they're going to come back and get you on it. So they can't do anything like that. So those are specific powers that are denied to them and included in the Constitution. All right, so Section 3 is going to be about the, the lower house called the House of Representatives of Congress. Um, the main idea in this section is the House of Representatives, with its frequent elections and regular reapportionment, is the more representative chamber of Congress. Its members carry out much of their work in committees. Okay, so how do you become a member of the House? Um, formally, you must be at least 25 years old, a U.S. citizen for at least seven years, and reside in the state and or district, because remember, this is based on population. Every state in the House of Representatives is based on population, and within that state that they draw up, which I haven't talked about yet, but I'm going to, they draw up districts, and it's a good idea if you actually not just live in the state, but live in the district that you represent, because people might think it's odd that you don't live in the area that that you're supposed to represent if you live somewhere else within the state. So, 25 years old, U.S. citizen, resident of the state. And the formal qualifications to be a member of the House, um, well, first you want to be able to appeal to your voters. You have been, you know, your name's out there, people know who you are, because again, you represent those people in the district. But um, having the ability to raise money is probably even more important. That way you can become familiar with your constituencies uh, constituencies and therefore they would vote for you. So having money and being able to raise money is a is a powerful way to help yourself get election and um and today um having to raise money is is a is vital. Um in two thousand six the house spent a combined average of more than one point five million dollars on, on um um raising money so for their campaign. So it, it takes a lot of money to run for office and get elected. So formally 25, seven years, years, citizen for seven years and resign your state. Informally, you need to be able to appeal and you appeal by raising money and getting your name out there. Okay, so because it's based on population, um, the number of members in the House of Representatives, every state has to has determine who, where those districts are going to be within your state, and so when you have a, when we have a census every ten years, the house must reapportion. And reapportion means, um, let's see if I have something right here. No. So population changes, and every ten years we do census, and because of that census, the number of of states that get different di uh, district different representatives changes, and for the most part. The eastern states lose seats, and the western and southern states gain seats because the population has been moving from the east to the west, towards the west and to the south more than more and more. So, for instance, Nevada, we keep on gaining seats because more and more people move here, while states like Pennsylvania and New York lose seats because they're losing people. It's a change of population. So every 10 years, the House must reapportion, um, which means that they must... What reapportion means is they um, seats are redistributed among the states based on the result of the census and um, so we must determine who gets what, how, what state gets what seats, that's basically it. Alright, redistricting, so they determine, you know, the census determines where people live, how many seats every state's going to get, and within that we got to redistrict. So the states, every state's responsible for drawing their district lines and deciding where where those districts districts are going to be? Um, this last census, two thousand ten, 
it was determined that Nevada gained enough population to gain a seat in the House of Representatives. Because remember, there's only 435 members, so that number always stays the same, and so the seats change. And because that our state, Nevada, has to redistrict or redraw the lines of how many di uh, of the districts that we have, because we had three before, now we have now we have four. So there's a new district, so they have to redraw the lines. And um, gerrymandering is just a is a way to um, have a political advantage in your favor. So the states determine it. The state leaders within your within your state are either going to be dominated by the Democrats or Republicans, and whoever is in control of the state government is going to draw lines that give them an advantage to win those districts. So you may draw the districts that are heavily one party, like heavily Democratic or heavily Republican, so that you can ensure or give yourself a better advantage of winning that, your party winning that district over the other party. So gerrymandering is just drawing lines that give you an advantage. And it's again, it's up to the state to determine where those lines are. Okay, and then one person, one vote. Um, because of gerrymandering, the Supreme Court had to get involved and basically they determined not every person's vote's not equally weighted the same because they are because some districts are so heavily had, had there's such there's such a disadvantage to one party in those districts. So um, the Supreme Court basically came in and said you must when you draw district lines they must be of equal population. So on average, districts are like four hundred thousand people, or maybe, or yeah, four hundred thousand to maybe seven hundred thousand. So that's a big difference. But on average, they they average around I think four hundred thousand four hundred thousand people per district. But it must be equal. So every district's equal, and um, that way is that that way not one party can have as big advantage over the other because of uh, the way they would draw the lines. All right, let's get out of that. That's. That sometimes can be confusing. That is kind of confusing. Uh, Reapportionment and redistricting. Okay, the leadership of the House. Um, it's led by the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House is the power, most powerful member in the House of Representatives. Um, they are elected by their members. So the, the entire House of Representatives elect the Speaker of the House. But it's going to be someone from the majority party who is going to be the Speaker of the House. Um... Let's see what else do I have here. The reason they're powerful is because they're the ones that decide um, where the bills, what bills go to which committees. They decide how long that they're going to debate for the, how long you debate for the bills. They also determine where the members of the house, the members of the house are going to be in, which committees they're going to be in, and they basically direct, they direct everything that goes on in the house. They direct. Um, the bills. They, I mean, they tell they put they, they put people in place where they want they feel they're best or not best. If you're in the minority party, you're not gonna you know you're not gonna have your bills heard ahead of uh, the majority party's uh, agenda. So they have a lot of power and control as Speaker of the House. And then you have other leaderships within the House, uh, the floor leaders, which would include your majority leader. From the majority party and the leader of the minority party is called a minority leader and these the minority leader basically is their job is to try to keep their party even though the minority they got to try to keep their party together when it comes to votes so they can use that as leverage against the majority party in case they need some of their votes to pass anything so you got your floor leaders which are just beneath the, the speaker of the house and then beneath them are what's called the whips and their job is to encourage follow fellow party members to vote with the party and stay with the party. Um, they also kind of, um, they also keep track of where the, the count is on the votes, like how many people are voting for this bill within the party and how many people are not voting. And if they feel like, if there's not enough people voting within the party, their job is to, again to encourage them to stay with the party and vote with the party. Um, so you got the floor leaders and the whips. And then the house rules, I'll go back. Um, the Constitution allows the House of Representatives to make their own rules to carry out their business, and um, so they have they have rules that they write and they change. The majority party has the has the power to change the rules. Once if they are if the majority party they get the, they can do that, and um, yeah, so that they have their own rules in the House. Okay, 
role of committees. Okay, so most of the work, let me see here, most of the work is done by, um, which is really weird. Oh, so most of the work in the, in Congress, in each chamber, the House of Representatives and the Senate, is done in committees. And the reason is because not everyone can be an expert on every policy that goes through um, Congress. So you're put into committees to be an expert within that specific committee so that you can inform the rest of the members where they maybe want, inform them how they should vote on a particular bill. So provide expert analysis. There are different types of committees. Uh, you got standing committees which are permanent committees. They, they're there every year because there's bills that always deal within these. Um, the House has 20 of these standing committees um, and they're, they're very broad major type of areas that laws fall into like agriculture, budgets, armed forces, um, yeah, and et cetera. There's 20 of them. Other type of committees you have are select committees, which are, they're, they're put together to carry a specific task, like an investigation on, um, on the housing market, or why, why, did a, why did the economy take a downturn, or maybe why did, why was JFK killed? How was JFK assassinated? So a select committee is just carried out for specific tasks. It's temporary. It's not a permanent type of committee. It's when they're done, they, they're done, the committee breaks up. Another type of committee is it's called joint committees. This is where both members of the House and the Senate come together and they are they're going to look at a broad issue and try to, to um, maybe come up with a law. And like right now, there's a, there's a joint committee in place to look at maybe making uh, an amendment to the Constitution which require the Congress to balance the budget. So it has both members and the broad issues, should we have a balanced budget every year and make that amendment to the Constitution. So joint committees, and there are again temporary as also. And every one of these committees, either in the standing or select or joint committees, they have a committee chairperson and the chair is gonna be someone from the majority party of the House and they are like a mini speaker of the house within the committee. They are the ones that determine um, what bills are going to be up, what bills are going to be heard, what bills are going to, how long you're going to debate on the bills, how many amendments you can make to the bills, um, but in a smaller setting within your committee itself. So um, committee chair people, chairpersons, they have a lot of power within the committee itself. And Membership to a committee, that's, um, you request your, you request what assignment you want to be, or you request what committee you want to be in, and then again, it's kind of left up to the majority party. They decide, they ultimately decide where you're going to go. So you request, you're going to want to be in the more, one of the, you're going to want to request to be in the more powerful one, so you have more of a influence. But again, it's up to the majority party and the Speaker of the House. Okay, the Senate. So we looked at the House, let's look at the Senate. Senate is considered the upper house because of its prestige that it reflects. Um, they have more members of the Senate have more power because they're more recognizable. There's there's 435 members in the House, so it's kind of hard to know. Other than the Speaker of the House, most people don't really know who who is the House, who are members of the House of Representatives. But in the Senate, there's a hundred of them, and because of there's less numbers of them, they're they're they tend to be better known. And because um, they also run statewide, they don't run for a district, they run for the whole state. So they're, they're more known um, within their state and also nationally. So it's more prestigious, it's the upper house. And um, to be, to qualify to run for Senate, you got to be a little bit older, five more years, 30 years compared to the house, which is 25. You must be a U U.S. citizen for at least nine years and reside in the state as, as well. So those are your formal qualifications to run. Informally, they're usually going to be older and wealthier. Well, they're obviously going to be older because you have to be older, but the average age is not 30. The average age is up, probably upper, upper 50s and 60s um, per senator. And they're usually the wealth, they're wealthier than members of the House. Um, it's also sometimes called a millionaire, millionaire, millionaire club because of all the, the number of millionaires within the Senate. So more of an elitist 
group of people in the Senate informally. And again, also, you're going to need um, to raise a lot of money. Um, in 2006, Senate candidates spent over $400 million um, in their races. So it's, uh, it's, still, it's expensive, more expensive than the House. All right, the leadership. Um, according to the Constitution, the president of the Senate is the vice president. The vice president is one that presides over the Senate itself. However, the vice president is rarely, rarely ever there. And the only job the president really has is to preside over the Senate. And But they can't debate. They don't, they don't do anything unless there's a tie. They would break a, a tie in the Senate um, if they were there. But they're never there because they really don't do much. They really have no power in the Senate, even though the president, even though the president said they don't really do much. So, since they're never there, we, the Constitution has what's called a president pro tempore, which is the person who presides when the vice president is not present, and that's pr pretty much most of the time. The vice president is rarely ever there, and the president pro, te pro, pro tempore is usually going to be from the. It's going to be from the majority party. And who's been there the longest? The most senior um, senator gets the honor of being the the president pro tempore, the person who presides over the Senate itself. Um, and they're they're third in line to become president, president pro tempore. So the Speaker of the House is second, president pro tempore is third in line to become president. Okay, so. The president pro tempore basically presides over the Senate, but they're not, they're not as powerful like the Speaker of the House is in the House. Um, the most powerful person in the Senate is the Senate Majority Leader. So the party leaders, they both have a Majority Leader and a Minority Leader, but the Senate Majority Leader is like is the Speaker of the House in the Senate. They're the ones with the most power. They're the ones that leads and, and speaks on behalf of the party within the Senate, and they lead by strategizing which which bills they feel are more important than others, and um, make sure, try to make sure that their policies that they want to get in place are pushed in front of the agenda compared to the minority parties. So the party leaders consist of the majority leader and the minority leader, but the leader basically is the majority leader. And again, just like the House, they, the Senate does most of the work in committees because they can't be on experts in everything. So there are different types of committees in the Senate, just like the um, House, they have standing committees, and just like the House, they have standing committees with subcommittees. So within your standing big committee, there's little committees within that standing committee to work on things as well. It's just breaking it down even more. Um, and they also have selecting special committees, which are temporary, compared to standing committees, which are permanent type committees. Um, let's see here. Select, selecting special committees, are again, are they're for a specific reason or purpose, and they're not going to be. They're not. They're not permanent. They they break. They break up after they're done with uh, whatever they're looking at. Okay, um, membership in the committees. Just like in the house, you're assigned by the majority party, uh, which committee you're going to be in, and you have committee chair people, um, who are the leaders within that committee, and they. Again, they are just like um, the leader of the Senate or the leader of the, the House. They they set the schedule. They decide what bills are going to be heard and, and when you're going to have hearings, like an investigation or something. So they lead the committee themselves, the committee chairperson. Um, so some specific powers or specific committee powers that are um, – our committees are very powerful within the Senate itself is the Senate Judiciary Committee. Because because Senate has the is the only chamber of Congress that examines um, presidential nominees, the Senate Judiciary Committee is a is a powerful committee because they are the ones that determine which judges are going to be confirmed or not confirmed, and specifically the Supreme Court, which has a very lasting effect on our country. And the other committee that's specifically unique to the Senate is the Senate Foreign Relations, because again, any treaty signed by the president must be verified or approved by the Senate. So the Senate Finance, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is the ones that does that. So it's a powerful committee to be within the Senate. Um, rules and tradition. So one rule that's unique to the Senate is called the filibuster. 
which is where a member of the Senate can refuse to stop talking. Once they get the floor, they can refuse to stop talking and talking and talking and talking. And, and by doing so, you, you're trying to kill a bill from ever coming up for a vote. Um, it's a tactic that can be done only in the Senate. And um, it's usually it's going to be done by the minority party because they're the ones that are, don't have the numbers to block a bill, to, to stop a bill from being passed. So it's a tactic they can use to try to stop a bill from being passed just because they they hold the floor, they control the floor. And by doing so, if you do it long enough, um, the Senate will be forced to move on to do something else because they know you're just going to filibuster. So it's a strategy to be done. It's been done before, and uh, the record is, um, I forget, it's like almost 24 hours, the record um, of holding the floor. You can't end a, clo a, a filibuster, which is called a cloture, if two-thirds of the Senate vote for cloture, then um, that ends that ends the debate. That ends the um, the ability to filibuster. So you can't stop the filibuster. So that's, there's a limit to that. Um, let's see discipline within the Senate. If you were if you were to consider if you if you did something that they felt like senators thought you felt you did uh, that was inappropriate, say like John John Ensign committing adultery and then paying off um, his work his uh, his employer to try to keep it under the wraps um, then you may be expelled they can vote you out of the club um, or you can just quit before they do that but some people are stubborn they don't want to be they don't want to they don't want to quit so they just, they have to be voted out so you can be disciplined in the Senate you can, same thing in the house this house can do the same thing and then if you were to leave if you were to leave because you were going to be disciplined like Senator Anderson the vacancy is filled by the governor, and uh, the governor filled that vacancy here in Nevada, the Senate seat of John Ensign, to Dean Heller, who was a member of the House. And because of that, now we're having an election just to fill Dean Heller's um, seat in the House. And so that's that. That's what takes place if someone leaves. If they leave or they get sick or they decide to retire, the governor chooses who that appointment is going to be. All right, so that's the Senate. All right, so the main job of the Congress is to pass bills, and there's there's steps that go along with passing a bill. The first step for a bill in Congress is um, introducing the bill. Um, so the main the main idea for this section is uh, the main, which is the main job of Congress is to make laws, and the process of making laws is well established and orderly. So the first step is introducing a bill. Um, any member of the House or Senate can introduce a bill. Um, however, only members of the House can can introduce a a revenue bill. That's something specifically in the Constitution that they have the power to do. And again, that's because they're closer to the people. If they're if the Congress is going to raise taxes or do something like that, they feel like the founders felt like the members of the House should be the ones that introduce it because if the people that they represent don't like that raising of taxes, then they can vote them out. Or they can keep them in. So only members of the House can introduce revenue bills. Um, other types of things they can do, they can besides introducing bills, they can they can do joint resolutions, which is the same as a bill, or it has a force of a law if it gets passed. But it's for an, it's only for out of the ordinary type circumstances, and. Um, Let's see here. For example, Congress used a joint resolution to authorize George Bush, President George Bush, to use military force against Iraq. Um, they're also used to propose constitutional amendments um, as well. So they're not they're not law they're not they're not laws they're trying to do, but they have the same ability of law, but they're for out of the ordinary circumstances. Another type of thing they can do besides introducing bills is called concurrent resolutions, where both houses address matters. When it comes to operational issues within the Congress, um, yeah. So, first step: introduce a bill. All right. Now, once the bill gets introduced in either chamber, it's going to go to a committee. Um, committees are the filter of Congress. Thousands of bills come into Congress. Um, 
I think like close to upwards of 10,000 bills going are proposed in Congress, but only like 600 are average passed a year. So the committees are a filter for that, for all those bills that are proposed, because they're not all good bills. So once they're proposed, they're assigned to a committee, and this is called um, referral, the process of referral. So the Speaker in the House and the Majority Leader in the Senate, um, they determine where the bill is going to go and which committee it's going to go to. Once it gets into committee, um, members are going to have what's called a hearing and they're going to get input on the bill from from anybody who wants to um, come in and talk about the bill. It could be so it, it's outside people. It's open to public and be it can be anyone. Members will at, invite people to come, they'll have witnesses come and you know give their thoughts, share their thoughts about the proposed bills that are in their committee. And it's just kind of it's kind of just get them kind of hearing what their constituents is how they feel about the bill. And within that, they'll be given they'll be so we'll go to the committee and then the committee will then put in a subcommittee to have more detailed hearings on it and the subcommittee is then going to have a report they report on the bill either going to be in a favorable way unfavorable way or without a comment back to the full committee and once it goes back to the full committee they have what's called a, it's called a markup process where they're going to debate the bill and maybe make some additional changes or amendments to the bill itself before it goes to the next step which is the floor so first step you introduce it, second it goes to committee, and within committee it's got to be referred to a committee, a specific committee, and then within that committee they're going to look at it, review it, change it, add things to it, and it's going to come out of there either with a favorable or unfavorable or without a comment report on it. So once it leaves committee, it goes to the floor for everyone within the House or in the Senate to vote on. In the House, they have what's called the House Rules Committee, which I'm not trying to, it's not, it's kind of confusing, but, and I'm not trying to confuse you, but once a bill leaves a committee in the House, it then goes to another committee, which is the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee is going to put a bunch of limits on the bill. Because there's 435 members, you've got to put time limits, you've got to put how many amendments, how many changes you can make to the bill, because there's so many of them, you can't have everyone talking about unlimited amount of time talking about a bill or debating a bill because you could never get anything done. So the rules committee is the traffic cop within the house and they put a bunch of limit more limits on the bill for what, before it goes to for up for debate. Um, also in the house they have what's called the committee of the whole because there's 435 members um, in order for them to conduct business by when they're in the committees you don't need necessarily everyone present to to vote on it. So committee of the whole is where you have at least half the members there, which is 218 um, members present to to vote and debate on a bill on the floor itself. And again, that's to keep 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 the the process going while having while while there's committee meetings going on. Everyone needs to be present um, for the on, on the floor. All right, within the Senate though, there is no rules committee or committee of the whole because there's less of them. They don't need to have those limitations on bills on the floor and um, if there are any requests to put limits and on the bills you got to get unanimous consent in order to do that in the Senate. So basically when it gets to the floor um, they're going to debate on it and then they vote. That's what happens in the, in the, on the floor. Now an option can take what's optional or what can take place is what's called a conference committee and this only takes place if there are two different versions of the same bill. And you can't have two different versions of a bill passed because there's different rules that go along with it. So bills that that bills that become law, they must be identical. And if that takes place, you have a conference committee where members of both the House and Senate come together and they, they look at the differences and they come to an agreement on their differences and then that bill goes on to the president to be voted on. So that's optional, only if there's two different versions of a bill. If there's not a different versions of the bill, that both houses didn't pass, then the next step is to go to the president. So it was proposed. It went to committee. Um, after it left committee, the bill went to the floor for a debate, and they voted on it, and they approved it. And there's only one version that was passed by both houses and Senate. The next step is going to the president. And the president has a couple options. He can either 
sign the bill and make it a law. Um, choose not to send it. Um, choose not to sign it. And after 10 days, if Congress is in session, then it becomes law. So just by not signing a bill, and 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 while Cong if Congress is in session, after those 10 days, it comes to the desk, it becomes a bill of a law. However, if they're not in session within those 10 days, when it goes to the president, and they adjourn, they go to recess, they go to you know have a vacation, um, then if the president doesn't sign it, it's it's vetoed. It doesn't become law. It's called a pocket veto. And the third thing a president can do is just veto the bill itself, or straight up send it back to Congress, and maybe tell them why he doesn't approve it. However, Congress can override a veto with two thirds majority vote from each chamber, which is the House and Senate. So, those are three things the president can do when a bill comes to his desk. All right, and that is Congress Chapter Five.